All right, so we're back. Now I want to actually show you, uh, so just remember what we just did because it's worth repeating. We took our center of mass velocity. We realized um, that that leads to momentum conservation because all I'm really doing is summing up the M's and B's for all the particles in the system. And that's really what we've always been calling the total momentum. So the constancy of the velocity of the center of mass leads to momentum conservation. But momentum conservation alone isn't enough to allow you to figure out what's going to happen in the system. So you need to know more information. So you either need to be told something about the after and you can figure out what you don't know, or you need to be given some other information. And one of the coolest bits of information or situations you can encounter is one where there is not only momentum conservation, but also conservation of kinetic energy in the collision, meaning there's no momentum loss and there's no energy, kinetic energy loss or gain in the system. It's constant. Let's um, actually, uh, so those have a name, Oop, and that's not how you spell it. Those have a name. They're called elastic collisions. There they are. And we're going to look at the most general case. And what I like about doing this, so this is one thing I want to say. Algebra isn't like terribly fun, but sometimes it's really satisfying. And it's actually really satisfying, especially when you can do it in an elegant way. And when I first learned how to solve these equations, I remember going through pages and pages of algebra, like tons of algebra, and still I would like wind up in the same place. I couldn't solve it. If you ever had that experience where you're trying to solve algebraic equations and you just keep plugging stuff in and you can't like get it to simplify, that's what would happen. And so your book doesn't actually go through all this algebra, but I want you to see it once, A, because it's kind of fun, and B, because when you derive these equations in their general form, which are pretty complicated equations as far as equations go, they're big, like they're long, they have a lot of terms in them, but when you analyze them, you, there's a lot of cool stuff in there, and I want you to be able to see that, because it's one of the things that I just think is really cool, and I think you'll think it's cool. So I need to get a sharp pencil for this one, because we definitely need it. Let's look at a situation. I'm going to be just super general right now. Um, I have two masses, M1 moving at V1 and M2 moving at V2, and I'm not even going to tell you which way they're moving. They just have to be moving so that they collide. One could be zero, one could be, they could be moving towards each other, one could be chasing the other. It doesn't really matter as long as they collide. I have M1, V1, and M2, V2. Instead of using F for final, I'm going to use prime for final because it's just a little easier to write when you're doing a lot of writing. So at the after, I'm still going to have M1 and M2. I'm not specifying whether they're moving, how they're moving at the end either, but I know that this one has a velocity V1 prime after the collision, and this one has a velocity V2 prime after the collision. And note those are not derivatives. They're just denoting final from initial. And so if you want to picture something, you could picture like two things coming in and then bouncing off each other. Or one being here, one comes in, one hits it, and then something happens. If you could picture whatever you want to picture, but this is the most general case. Now we know that if it's, it's a collision, so we know we can say P initial equals P final. And if it's elastic, we can also say that K initial equals K final. And so let's write out both of those equations. P initial equals P final will give us M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And all we're really doing there is doing our center of mass sum, what we did before, equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. That's it. I can't really do much there. Um, and then my kinetic, that's from, that follows from 1. From equation 2, I get 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared equals 1 half m1 v1 prime squared plus 1 half m2 v2 prime squared. And that's lovely. And with the way, I, you know, you might be inclined to say, well, I'm going to solve for v1 prime. Like the idea is that you know v1 and v2. You don't know v1 prime and v2 prime. But, um... That should be a 2. Let me just make sure that looks like a 2. M1 V1 prime squared, M2 V2 prime squared. <laughs> and so um, this, uh, it seems like this, you know, if I know V1 and V2, 
I don't know v1 prime and v2 prime, but I can figure them out because I have two unknowns and I have two equations. So how hard can it be? The problem is if you solve for like a v1 or v2 prime and plug it in here, you get this massive quadratic equation and it's really hard to solve. So it's a ton of algebra and, and it's really big pain. And I, you can wind up doing pages and pages of algebra and getting nowhere. So I'm going to show you what I, a way that I like to, to get these equations. Um, one is to start with this equation, and instead of grouping it by initial and final, I'm going to group it by mass. So all the m1s on the left, all the m2s on the right. So that gives me m1 times v1 minus v1 prime equals m2 times v2 prime, <coughs> excuse me, minus v2. And um, so I have that. And now, um, and just pause, if you don't really see how I got there, take a second, pause it, and just convince yourself that you're with me here, because it's important to follow every step of the way, and there's no rush, so you can pause it and make sure it makes sense, and then continue. Okay, so I can also look at this equation now, and I can realize that the halves are not important, so I can cancel those out. And I get m1 v1 squared plus m2 v2 squared equals m1 v1 prime squared plus m2 v2 prime squared. And you say, well, why do I care? Well, I'm going to do the same thing that I did up here. I'm going to put all the m1s on one side and all the m2s on the other side. So again, you can pause it here and try it yourself if you want to practice your algebra or you could just follow along. So I get m1 times v1 squared minus v1 prime squared equals m2 times v2 prime squared minus v2 squared. Now pause the video and think. When you have a difference of squares, how can you write it? So pause it and think. When you have difference of squares, what can you do? So you might have realized that um, when you have a difference of squares, you can factor it out as a plus and a minus, and that's what I'm going to do. So m1 times v1 squared minus v1 prime, sorry, m1 v1 minus v1 prime times v1 plus v1 prime is m2, same thing, v2 prime minus v2 and v2 prime plus v2. And now you say, well, why didn't Miss Lavinia go and do that? Like, what's the point in, what's the point in factoring it out? Like, it's not like it's helping me solve. But let's come back up to this equation, which was the momentum conservation equation that we grouped by mass. m1 v1 v1 minus v1 prime. m1 v1 minus v1 prime. So there's that. m2 v2 minus v2 prime. m2, uh, sorry, v2 prime minus v2. So that's the same. Well, if I have two things, since this equals this, and this equals that, I can just cancel those out. Convince yourself that that's true. And look at what I'm left with. This, I went from this messy quadratic equation to this beautifully simple linear equation. v1 plus v1 prime equals v2 prime plus v2. And I also have this lovely linear equation which is m1 times v1. In fact, I'm going to not even write that one. I'm going to go back to my original momentum conservation equation from the top here. So out of this crazy equation, I actually got a nice simple equation that's going to be super useful because what I can do here is I can solve it for v1 or v2 prime pretty easily and come back up here and plug it in. And that's going to let me get something without having to deal with squares and all this messy business. So I'm going to rewrite my momentum conservation equation. m1 v1 plus m2 v2, which I'm always going to keep doing this, which is just our center of mass velocity, <laughs> right, our center of mass momentum, equals m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime. That's just momentum conservation. And now I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to solve this. I'm just going to go ahead and solve it for v1 prime, and I'm also going to solve it for v2 prime. So v1 prime equals v2 prime plus v2 minus v1, and convince yourself that that's true. And if you want to pause it, now we're going to solve it for v2 prime. So you can go ahead and do that and just check it. That's going to be equal to v1 plus v1 prime 
uh, minus v2. And you can already see a symmetry starting to happen. When you start to notice symmetries in physics, like that's like you say, well, how do I know if I'm doing the algebra right? It could be so debilitating to like keep plowing through, and I don't know if I'm doing it right. But you, these little symmetries, they're kind of like, they're like the granola bar in the marathon. Like you say, oh, I feel a symmetry coming on here. And then you're like, I think I'm right. I think I'm doing it right because I get that little boost of hope, and that keeps you going on to the next step. And so that's an important part of doing these kinds of problems is you start to, the symmetries kind of start to give you like a sense that you're on the right track. You don't really know until the end and it's okay. You can always go back and start over if you make a mistake. Okay, so here we are. I have this. I'm going to keep my business on the left pretty constant. But now I'm going to try to get rid of V2. So I'm going to use this one. I'm going to plug V2 in for here. M1 V1 prime plus M2 and I'm going to put in all of this for V2 prime v1 plus v1 prime minus v2. And now I'm going to expand it all out. m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals m1. This is the part you can go fast through if you want. m2 v1 plus m2 v1 prime minus m2 v2. Okay, and again, you can keep going fast through this part if you want. Um, I'm going to now put all of the, I'm going to try to isolate just the V1 prime terms on this side so I can solve for V1 prime and mash everything else over to the other side. M1 V1 plus M2 V2 minus M2 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 plus M2 times V1 prime. Convince yourself you want to do the algebra yourself and pause it and get there. That's fine. You can do that. Okay. And so now, look, I have two of these guys, so I can group them, and then these are both in terms of V1. So I can write this as M1 minus M2 V1 plus 2 M2 V2 equals whatever's on this side. But I'm going to actually divide by this, so I just have V1 prime left. So I get over M1 plus M2 divided by M1 plus M2, and that's my V1 prime. And I don't know why I suddenly cannot write. Sharp V1 prime. So look at this beautiful equation. It has a really nice look to it, I think, right? This sort of sum and difference and the two over the thing. Um, you could check that it has velocity units, and it does. Um, so that's nice. Now, it seems like it might be an exercise in tedium just to, like, go over the next part. But I really want to. And the reason I want to do that is, um, the reason I want to go over the next part is because when you get both of these equations, I'm going to fold the top over just so I have a little bit more room. When you, both of these equations really turn out uh, to have a really elegant uh, final result, and that's what we're going to look at in a second. So let's, um, let's come back again to where we were. Let's see, how do I make it so you can see all of this? Um, there we go. Okay. Remember, I started with my momentum conservation. M1 V1, M2 V2 is M1 V1 prime, M2 V2 prime. I'm going to write that out over here again. M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. But instead of solving and plugging in for V2 prime and getting everything in terms of V1, I'm going to do the opposite. Now, you know, you can try this on your own. You can skip until I get the next result. All I'm going to do right now is plug this in uh, for V1 prime and solve for V2. So I'm going to do that super fast. So M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1. And for V1 prime, I'm going to put V2 prime plus V2 minus V1. V2 prime plus V2 minus V1 and then plus M2 V2 prime from this term. And now I'm going to expand it out um, and bring it over to the other side. So I get, let's see, M1 V1, M2 V2, M1 V2 prime plus M1 V2 minus M1 V1 plus M2 V2 prime. I'm going to keep the V2 primes over here. 
And I'm going to bring this over to here, and I get m1 v1 plus m2 v2 minus m1 v2 plus m1 v1. Sorry, this was... Yep, that's right. Yep, that's all right. And then um, equals m1 plus m2 times v2 prime. So you can see it was very similar to what I got up here. But now I have two of the m1 v1s instead of the two of the m2 v2s. And so I'm going to group this. Again, I have m2 minus m1 times v2. So m2 minus m1 v2 plus 2 m1 v1 divided by m1 plus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 equals v2 prime. Okay, take a look at these two equations because it's pretty awesome. I have v1 prime, the velocity of 1 after the collision, the velocity of 2 after the collision. Um, first, I have m1 minus m2 times v1 over m1 plus m2. Here I have m2 minus m1 v2. So it's switched and it's the other velocity. Here I have 2m1 v1 over the sums. Here I have 2m2 v2 over the sums. So this symmetry automatically tells you that you think you're on the right track, right? The next thing that's pretty cool is you could say, well, okay, why don't, like, what makes them positive or negative, the v1 prime and v2? Like, what makes the thing go to the right or to the left? Like, how do you know it's going to happen? And you could see, first of all, that this term is going to be equal to whatever. It's going to depend only on the um, velocity of whatever the first one was. But you're going to have this coefficient in here on the v1 that's going to depend on the relative sizes of the masses. And that's going to play into how the masses, what direction they go in. It's going to make this term either positive or negative, depending on what the sign of v2 was. And then when you combine with this, you could see that the relative masses are going to play into how uh, the velocities come out in terms of sign. Um, let's look at a few really cool cases. So you say, what's the point of this? I could just now, I could look these up, I could plug in numbers, I can get velocities. That's not exciting. No, but like you could program, like you could write Python code that for a bunch of crazy collisions is going to generate the velocities and plot out trajectories of particles and particle physics collisions. And that's great. That's one thing this could be useful for. But what's cooler is to be able to say when, when things collide and the collision is elastic, like why does it do what it does? I just think that's really cool. I always wondered, like why do things happen the way they do? How do the balls know to go off in a certain direction? Like how do they know that? The answer is these equations, the math of the elasticity combined with the momentum conservation case. So let's look at a couple of really quick, simple cases. Let's look at a situation. Um, I'm going to now fold these up because they're my special reference equations. Here they are, right up there. And I'm going to, um, let's start writing like right below. So, in fact, I'll, I'll, let's look at a situation where um, they have equal mass. M1 is coming in at a velocity v, and M2 is uh, not moving initially. What's going to happen there? Like, if they're elastic and momentum is concerned, if they stick, they're going to go off at half the velocity. We know that. But if they don't stick, what's going to happen? Well, let, we don't even have to do calculations. Let's take a look at what's going to happen here. So... We automatically know that v2 is 0, so this whole term is going to be 0, because this guy isn't moving, okay? If m1 and m2 are equal, what's going to happen here? m1 minus m2, this term is going to be 0. It tells us that the velocity of mass 1 after the collision is going to be 0. So this guy hits this guy, this guy stops. That's interesting, and that's maybe not expected. Now let's come over here and say what happens. Well, v2 was 0, the second mass was initially at rest, so this whole term is gone. And if the masses are equal, 2m over 2m is going to cancel. It just tells you that v2 goes off at the velocity that v1 had. So let's think about what this is. These come in, this guy stops, and this guy goes off with v. It literally transfers all of its velocity to the other mass. That Newton's cradle that does this, this is what's going to happen. 
this is why that happens. This is why that Newton's cradle thing is like such a beautiful thing, because it's a, it's almost a perfectly elastic collision, and that transfer of one to the other is great. And you could say, what if it's 3m coming in, and what happens, and how do the velocities compare? All the things that you could do playing with those Newton's cradles amount to analyzing these two equations. Let's look at another situation where the two masses are equal and they're coming in and they hit each other at equal velocities. So m1 and m2 are equal, right? So this term is going to go away and this term is going to go away. So we're left with just these two terms. And if the masses are equal, these, the v2, like these coefficients are just going to be 1. But if v2, remember v1 and v2 are approaching each other like this, v1, let's say, is positive, v2 is negative, they're opposite. So what it tells you is that v1 prime is going to become v2, and v2 prime is going to become 1. In other words, the particles are going to come in, and the particle moving to the left is going to become the particle moving to the right, and the one moving to the right will become moving to the left. They're just going to bounce off and go off at the same velocity. It tells you what's going to happen. I just think this is so cool that you can take these two equations and you can analyze them for a whole bunch of situations and it tells you and that's why that thing in Newton's cradle is so fascinating because it really is just beautiful math like playing out right before your eyes. Okay, so that's it for this. Um, I feel like this is enough. I'll make one more video, video if you don't feel like watching the next one. I totally get it. We'll be able to build off of what we have right now but I'll make it anyway because I'm on a roll with my pencil. Um, but that's it for tonight. You can stop here.